Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames are down to the last week of the season, and uh, Matt, they probably did better this week than I think we all expected them to. Well, it's typical of the Flames when uh, you're in the last uh, week of the season or two, and uh, the games don't matter, and the only thing that matters for drafting purposes, and then you go on a hot winning streak to kind of tank your draft position. So, yeah, Uh, it's been a good week for on ice play but uh not so much in terms of the off ice stuff well let's jump into it i guess some might say the flames had a bad week because they got more wins and more wins means potentially a different uh draft position but the flames started the week on the road they went on their uh california road trip not a bad way to almost finish off your season and started the week in san jose taking on the san jose sharks in this one Kuzmenko uh, scored uh, scored a goal to get his uh, extend his point streak to six as the Flames got a three to two loss over the, or sorry three to two win over the Sharks and the goals came from Kadri Kuzmenko and Anderson. What were your thoughts on this one? Uh, I thought that the Flames played poorly in this game overall, despite getting the win. Um, it's just that San Jose is on a different level of being terrible than Calgary is. And it, frankly, watching the Sharks, it reminded me of their inaugural season uh, when it was basically Kelly Kissio and that was it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, they were not very good um, to start. Uh, and uh, the San Jose Sharks are a very terrible team and Calgary tried their best to uh, go punch for punch with them, but... Uh, the fact that you needed, you know, an extra frame to beat the Sharks yeah. definitely tells you you're not playing well. Dustin Wolf was in net. Dustin Wolf, I thought, you know, was probably one of the better players in this game. But you're right. I mean, the Flames, as we've seen so often, played down to their opponent. Yeah, and especially in this one, like, it it was just a sloppy performance from basically everybody. Like, I can't say that anybody specifically had a really good dynamite game. Like, it just seemed to be a lot of blah basically which you know you, you kind of expect in uh games against like the sharks when like nothing matters for either team yeah but i mean you know these are the things we've talked about for so long is you've got to whether you know the game's necessarily on the line or not you've got to be able to beat those bad teams and i think this is one of the reasons and we'll talk more about this later in the show but this is one of the reasons the flames are where they are true Right. If you can't, you know, be beating the Sharks handedly or Chicago or teams like that, I mean, you're going to run into issues. Oh, for sure. And it's not like the Flames are icing a very different roster now than they have for most of the season. No, and to their credit, uh, defensively, the team is starting to look a little bit more composed overall now that they've been together for over a month. It's still the talent level, though, is just not there on the, the blue line. So it's. It's very hard, uh, frankly, for the team to have cohesive structure when so much has changed in so little time. The Flames had uh, Wednesday off, probably played some golf, and then on Thursday they were in L.A. to take on the L.A. Kings. Jacob Markstrom back in the net for this one as the Calgary Flames lost 4-1, to one, which clinched the playoffs for the Kings. Um, I... I thought there were some flashes in this game of the Flames looking good, but overall, again, a really lousy game for the Flames, in my opinion. Yeah, they kind of got their head caved in in this one. Um, Not a good performance by anybody, and uh, it was, you know, what you would expect from a team fighting for a playoff position versus a team fighting for a draft pick. And, yeah, like, uh, they were not good at all in this game, and... As you said, a couple of flashes of cohesive play, but, you know, you need to be able to play 60 minutes, not like a couple of flashes here and there. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, for me, I was watching them and you'd see something. It's like, okay, they're getting it together. And, you know, they'd have a good minute or two. And then 
it would kind of go yeah. away, you know, and, and they'd just fall apart again. And then they'd sort of get their stuff together and you'd get a minute or two of good play and then it would fall apart again. And they just, they looked sloppy. They, they didn't look like they were invested in the game. Uh, it, it was a very bad outing for the Flames. I agree. So the next night, the Calgary Flames were in Anaheim, one of the shortest trips in the NHL on a road trip. Most teams bust this because it's so short. And the Calgary Flames get a big win, 6-3 over the Ducks. Kuzmenko gets a hat trick, his second one in his career. Matt, it was funny. He didn't even know he got a hat trick. Oh, I know. It, it, that uh, goal, it looked like uh, Kadri had tipped it in, the second one for Kuzmenko. Uh, especially from his point of view, but uh, on the replay, you could see the just deflected in off of Gibson. Um, so I, I can understand why he was confused on that one. His second career hat trick there. Um, you know, and, and it's, if you look at it, like the Flames had, were up 4 nothing and ended up losing or ended up winning this one 6-3, to three, sorry. So, you know, while it's great to be up for nothing, giving up three goals in any period, you can tell there's a lapse there. Yeah, and frankly, the uh, timeout by um, Ryan Huska uh, allowed uh, the team to settle down a bit. And, uh, th like, they were very panicky um, after the second Ducks goal. And then, um, you know, the, the third one came shortly thereafter. But after... Uh, the Ducks drew to within one. They, the Flames settled their game down, and Kuzmenko added a pair to drive the Flames to victory. Yeah, it was a well-timed timeout for sure. Um, I thought, you know, in this one, the Flames probably of the whole week, even the game that's going on as we're recording against Arizona, this was probably the best 60 minutes of hockey we saw from the flames. Yeah. The game got a little bit away from them for the first seven minutes of the third period. But beyond that, like the flames played fairly well throughout and Anaheim is just a terrible hockey team. Yeah. And you know, while the game you're right, got away from them for a bit, I think part of being a good team is being able to realize that and, you know, pick up a game when you start to lose it. And I, I think that's what we saw from the Flames here. Like you said, things started to go out of hand and they started to get goals against. And I think the whole team at that point just kind of looked at it and said, okay, we can't let this happen. Let's let's figure things out. Yeah, and uh, they were able to collect the two points and uh, continue their winning streak in Anaheim. I think that's now eight in a row that the Flames have won in Anaheim. So, you know, going from like losing 20 in a row to now winning eight... Yeah, it, it's just bizarre. The Honda Center's not as scary as we maybe thought it was. It's like, oh, maybe we can win here. Okay, we will. <laughs> and then the Calgary Flames uh, came home after that. They are, as we record this on Sunday the 14th, taking on the Arizona Coyotes in what nobody thought would be a historic game, but will. Likely the very last ever game between the Calgary Flames and the Arizona Coyotes. It's expected that the team will be moving from Arizona to Salt Lake City next year. Um, and as we're recording right now, the Calgary Flames are up 6-5 in the third. These are not these are not two teams that you expect 11 goals in a game. No, like usually the Coyotes games are the most boring of games on the Flames schedule. Uh, and th that's been that way for the entire time they've been the Coyotes. Like for whatever reason, the games against them have always just been real boring snorefests where it's like 2-1, 3-2, 1-0, and not any entertainment in the game. Both teams just feel flat, and it's like, okay, let's go. Something, anything, anybody alive out there, hello. <laughs> and from what we're seeing from the Flames so far tonight, I think that they're looking fine when they have the puck. It's the play without the puck that's the issue. Yeah, for. like, when they're in the offensive zone, like, they're very dangerous, and, like, they've scored six goals on 23 shots as of uh, when we're recording this. And, you know, like, the Coyotes, though, like, they're getting lots of good prime scoring chances as well, and, like, plays where, like, shooters are wide open to receive the one-timer pass across, and... 
you know, like it, it's one of those where like just defensively you cannot be letting the uh, intended shooter being that wide open where, you know, like you, you're basically like giving him an Ovechkin style shot from his office, you know, on an e empty net with Wolf having to dive across to try and flail at it. Like it, it's just not you know, not a way that you actually play defense at an NHL level and expect to have any success. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, when I watch this game tonight, it just feels like the Flames have finally had it, like they're done. Yeah, and yet they're up 6-5, and, you know, I think it's one of those where both these teams are, frankly, garbage, and... You know, it's like, oh, no, we don't want to win, so here, have the prime scoring chance. Oh, well, we got one. Well, here, have it back. And, you know, it's not not a defensive clinic, that's for sure. With his goal tonight, uh, Igor Sharangovich, who scored the 5-4 goal for the Flames, ended up becoming the highest-scoring Belarusian player, I think, most points in one season, as he now has 59 uh, points a season, 31 goals. So breaking breaking a record tonight, even in a bad game. Yep, and that's great for him. I'm glad to see. It's always nice when a player of yours sets a all-time record uh, for his nation. Um, like, we saw that, like, Hakan Lube in 88-89, uh, scoring 50 goals, like, even today, he's the only Swede ever to score 50 goals in a season. Um, you know, and it's always neat to have, like, those kind of things associated with your team and your players. You know, and I know the, the NHL is doing the Four Nations Cup next year, and we don't know what the World Cup format looks like, but it's too bad that with only four nations, guys like Sharon Govich will not be able to participate. No, and that was one of the strengths of that weird World Cup thing that they had where you had, like, Team North America's under-23s and, you know, like a Team Europe situation, so that way, you know, guys like Kopitar could actually play, um... You know, instead of, or a guy like Sharon Govich, where, you know, there's like maybe five or six players from Belarus in the NHL right now, uh, you know, certainly not enough to field a high-end team, but yet, you know, there is high-end players there. Yeah, and even if you don't want a team with Russia on the name, I get it, but maybe allowing some of those Russian players to play for a world team or a Europe team yeah. or something like that. I, and then Matt, I guess we should we should maybe discuss this while we're talking about this game here before it's over. Is uh, again that idea last Arizona Coyotes game ever in Calgary? We don't have a lot of uh, details on this, but it's being said by a lot of insiders this deal's all but done, sending Arizona to Salt Lake. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, about time. Uh, frankly, uh, I don't think that they should have ever played a game in Mullet Arena, and I think they should have been moved before that season even happened. And frankly, it was an embarrassment that uh, that team had to play in that building and that the situation hasn't been resolved till now and about time. And it sucks for the fans of Arizona. I'm not, you know, like I hate seeing teams leave. It's just the whole situation's been a gong show for years and years and years. And it's one of those where it's about time that they moved and... It's sort of like how the Atlanta Thrashers, when they moved to uh, Winnipeg, like the writing was on the wall for a long time. And, you know, it, with the land auction thing happening and it not being a guaranteed that the owner was going to either win the auction or uh, get approval for a new building, like there just made zero sense for this team to exist there anymore. And even if we knew he was going to win it, I mean, buildings take, you know, three, four years to build. So they'd have to be playing a mullet arena for even that much longer. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's just not a good idea overall. Uh, so we will find out how this takes place over the next couple of weeks. Apparently, according to some insiders, after Arizona was in Edmonton, they told um, all the players that this was happening. Nothing's been officially announced by the league yet, 
Any idea, Matt, on what on what you think the t- the name for the new team will be? Oh, I know it won't be Coyotes because, uh, frankly, if you're going into a new situation and you're having a team like the Coyotes, who have been terrible since like 2011, you know you're gonna want to have a different brand than that. You know, like the Atlanta Flames when they were a team, like they were still a decent team. Uh, when they moved here and like you have a team like the Atlanta Thrashers who were also equally embarrassing when they moved and well, the you Jets... also couldn't go back to Winnipeg and be the Winnipeg Thrashers no but you know there how would you say it's different like if the team had a good legacy before moving but you know like when the Quebec Nordiques moved like they were a bad team for a long time and then they moved and became the Avalanche. The Hartford Whalers were awful and became the Hurricanes. The Jets were terrible and became the Coyotes. Like, there was no... Like, basically, like, if teams had any quality to them upon relocation, like the Minnesota North Stars uh, and becoming the Dallas Stars, like, at least, uh, like, they had just been in the Stanley Cup Final, like like two years prior you know and or the flames who are successful like the new city kept the team name because it you know wasn't a toxic brand i think the coyotes is a toxic brand well and even with the coyotes being nicknamed the desert dogs you can't really change that interestingly uh salt lake has a basketball team the utah jazz they were named the jazz when they were in new orleans which made sense and they kept that name moving over to um, Utah, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So I guess we'll, we'll end up seeing what it is that they come up with, but I heard a rumor online and at this point I'm starting to forget who says what I'd love to give credit to it, but that owner Ryan Smith has sent out a name that team contest. So we'll see what they end up getting. Well, hopefully it'll be something interesting and different instead of like generic, uh, you know, like the blizzard or something something along those lines like you know something different like the golden knights and kraken uh as much as like the knights is a bit hokey like they're at least different and kind of unique names they also had a lot more time to come up with those brands i think you might get something not as great because this team's gonna i would say probably have to have a name by the draft in a few months they don't have a year you know, 18 months to come up with a name like some of those expansions. Did. True. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see a sort of placeholder logo for whatever the team is for a year. Well, it's sort of like uh, the th- uh, Jets when they moved uh, and Mark Shifley got the NHL jersey uh, instead of the Jets jersey at the draft. Yeah, but I mean, I could even see not having, I mean, if you think about the timing on it, especially if they're going to use an unconventional color, to get, you know, all your helmets, your pants, your jerseys made by, you know, rookie camp or even by, uh, you know, training camp in September might not be feasible. So you may end up seeing, I could totally see it, where these teams are wearing sort of a placeholder temporary jersey in season one. I think they'll get it in time. Like, it, it would be different if, uh, like, they weren't changing the, uh, the manufacturer as well. So it's kind of like everybody's on that same footing a, a bit. But I think that the manufacturer knows what everyone else is wanting already. True. And I, I, don't I don't think, think the Flames that, are submitting their order yeah, now. I don't think that it'll take that long. Um, just because, um, like, frankly, I think that uh, probably during the playoffs, they'll have their new team name. I don't think it'll even be till the draft. And I think, like, you'll see, like, logos and all that kind of stuff by the draft and, you know. We'll see. Yeah. Well, with that, the uh, we don't know how the game on Sunday, the Arizona game, is turning out. It's still ongoing yeah, as we're talking. Yeah, four minutes remaining in the third. Uh, but if we take a look at where the Flames stand going into this game now in the stats, the Calgary Flames are... Uh, oh, let me go to Western Conference. That would help. The Calgary Flames are are now six in the wildcard race. Um, essentially six... Six out of ten in wildcard teams. The two wild cards are now decided. It'll be Nashville and uh, Vegas, which means St. Louis has 91 points, barely outside. Calgary, after 79 games, has 36 wins, 38 losses, five overtime losses for 77 total points. 
Arizona right behind us at 75, then the Ducks 57, Chicago 51, San Jose 47, and the Kraken right above us at 79. So kind of middle of the pack of the losing yeah, teams. Yeah, and realistically, the Flames, if they hold on to win, uh, like they're going to pass Seattle into the ninth worst spot uh, in the draft rankings and uh, could finish with as many as 83 points. And they have uh, the tiebreaker on Seattle, but they do not on either New Jersey or Buffalo ahead of them. Uh, so, you know, they'd have to basically win out and Buffalo and New Jersey would have to lose their games in order for the Flames to pass them. Uh, realistically, um, the game against Vancouver probably will result in a loss, so the Flames will probably finish in the top nine. Um, doubtful that uh, they go down if they win this game i was uh, using tankathon.com which has a mock draft simulator and i was running it i think i ran about 20 times today and the flames came up always at number eight um, except for twice when they were number nine so as things sit right now with this Arizona game not completed. The Calgary Flames are likely to draft eighth this year. Yeah, or ninth, uh, depending on Seattle. Um, but where things are at right yeah. now. Well, if there's we'll like discuss, two minutes. We'll discuss the yeah. next couple of games next yeah, week. Yeah, there's two minutes left, and uh, the Flames seem to be in control of the game. So if uh, that's the case, then uh, the Flames will pass Seattle for ninth. So, Matt, you and I talked last week about Dustin Wolf and the workload that he needed to get for the rest of the season. And we kind of said he had to play 50% of the games minimum going forward. This week, he started three of the four. How do you feel about that workload for Perfect. him? Um, he needs the ice time. And uh, frankly, when you're playing three weak teams uh, that are more of an AHL caliber than NHL caliber, um, you know, he needs to, you know, he... He's at least more familiar with that kind of level of game uh, and team opponent instead of L.A., so um, it's more important for him to ease himself into more... Um, more familiarity with that. In exactly. That and he hasn't played badly in any of the games. Like Even though he gave up five goals thus far in the Arizona game... Um, he's, he, you know, he was not really responsible for a number of the Flames goals against, like a really exceptionally bad defense caused a lot of it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, um, he's, he's not playing bad. He has not only played really bad all week, but you'd only be as good as the D in front of you, especially when you're new, when you're a new goaltender. Yep. Flames have two more games after this. How many do you expect to see Wolf uh, Probably in? both. I would agree. that I think even though Vancouver's a good team, I think it'll be a good test of Wolf to put him in that game and see how things go. Yeah. And realistically, um, for Vancouver, like uh, they don't have a ton to worry about. Like They've got a five-point lead on Edmonton uh, for the division, so they're going to win the division yeah, they'll likely play their backup in that one. Yeah, too. so like it's one of those where, um, like they're not gonna be trying as hard. Uh, like the modus operandi for them is gonna be don't get hurt. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like it, it's not gonna be the exact highest uh, intensity game, even though it's a top tier opponent. And then we play the Sharks again, who are the worst team in the NHL. So, uh. Two perfectly good opponents for um, Wolf to get a start in. Yeah, I think so too. And as we talked about, Wolf needs, we need to see what Wolf can do as an everyday starter. And giving him, you know, six of the last or five of the last six games, I think is a great way to, to test that and see if he can do it night in and night out. Yeah, and realistically, it'll just help him in the offseason and, you know, when the Flames uh, or the Wranglers run in the playoffs. Um, for him having the higher level experience so that way uh, they can work towards getting, you know, to that next tier with him. And, um, you know, he needs to take another step if he wants to be a starter in the NHL and every bit helps. 
And I did check. I said it last week, and I just wanted to make sure I was I was speaking correctly. Uh, he is in Calgary as an officially a, an emergency recall because of uh, Dan Vladar being out. So he is eligible to um, essentially still go down to the HL if we need him to, though he won't, and still eligible for HL playoffs. Yep. Um, and then the other guy this week that I think is is worth talking about is Kuzmenko. And we talked about him last week. He got the hat trick this week. He's uh, looking good in the Arizona game, or I guess as good as you can in this Arizona game. Um, he's he's already on the board tonight as well. Um, you know, I think a lot of us were not sure what to make of him coming into Calgary. As you mentioned last week, when he's good, he's good. When he's not, he's not. Um, I've heard recently they dropped some weight, which could be a reason why he's playing better too. But you know what? I think if if you look at this, I mean – People are calling this the Elias Lindholm trade. Really, Kuzmenko's ended up being the better deal or the better player. Oh, significantly team. so. Like, it's almost the Andre Kuzmenko trade yeah, now. Yeah, and it's like, oh, thank you for giving us the first and two good prospects to take the best player in the trade. Like, yeah, and and I don't think that uh, Lindholm will be in Vancouver no. next year. I don't think Lindholm will be impactful for Vancouver in the playoffs. I think at this point, I know some people thought the Flames would take Kuzmenko and flip him. I think at this point, you keep him. That really depends, in my opinion, on uh, what the numbers look like and the term. Like, realistically, Kuzmenko is a very one-dimensional player, and he's exceptionally good at that one dimension. And, like, he can... Well, he scored 39 last year. He's on an over-40 goal pace with the Flames. Um, it, it's just one of those where... He's also 28, and, you know, if he's looking for, like, a five- or a six-year deal, uh, I would not touch that with a 10-foot pull, um, just because of the fact that, frankly, you know, if he regresses like he did this year with Vancouver, like, that could be a James Neal-esque, uh, like, oy, <laughs> bad trade, or bad signing. We heard Craig Conroy say that going into the offseason, he's... I forget exactly which interview it was, but he's kind of looking to bring in some free agents on three-year, kind of two, three, four-year deals as a bridge contract. I think if you're looking at Kuzmenko, you've got to be looking at the same, right? I think if he wants to come back on a two- or three-year deal, yeah. you would probably definitely welcome that. Oh, yeah, and I think that uh, realistically, he would probably want to... Um you know, if all things are being equal, he probably would prefer to sign with a better team um, that's, you know, more of a playoff caliber team than what the Flames will be. Uh, but it, it's... We'll see if he can work himself into that yeah, position. Yeah, it's one of those that, like, he would probably want to play here for, you know, at least till the trade deadline next year. Um, so, you know, because he will be getting all the prime opportunities, uh uh, you know, to score as many goals and earn that high-end contract in the offseason. It's just one of those that, with him specifically, I'm a little concerned uh, of length of term. Um, some guys, you know, like, say, like, Backlund before or Uyghur or that, it's like, nah, no concerns whatsoever. But with him, it, his lack of defensive game really hurts um, and if it wasn't for that, then, you know, a six, seven year deal would be perfect. It's just, he's too streaky to, uh, rely on for that long. But, um, you know, if it ended up being like a two year, $7 million a season, if he replicates this kind of thing next year, I'd be perfectly fine with that. Yeah, so for fans that aren't aware, he's on a $5.5 million deal the Flames got in the trade this year and next year. So the Flames could t start talking to him about an extension if they want to July 1st. I don't think you make an extension with him that early. And he does have a, a modified no trade as well. There's a 12-team no trade list, and that came into factor when he got traded here. I think this is a guy you probably don't start talking extension to until at least January to see, do we want him? Is he, you know, still performing well? Is it going to be a deadline move? Oh. I, I I would be surprised if we see, you know, sometime in July that you got a three-year deal with Kuzmenko. Yeah, I, I yeah, and everything timeline-wise that you said, I agree with 100%. And, like, it just doesn't make any sense to rush it, it just like it didn't really with – 
any of Lindholm, Tanev, or Hannafin. You know, like, you threw out your offers for those guys, but you didn't push it until it got close to the trade deadline. They didn't want to sign here. Okay, you're on. You know, on your way out. And I think that, you know, with guys like Manjapane, like Kuzmenko, um, you know, you're going to look at next year and say, well, you know, this team's with the veteran guys is not going anywhere. Um, you know, and, but at the same time, if he continues to be streaky, that might be his only option. True. And it, it's one of those where I think that, uh, that will just largely depend on how he plays. And like, if he's Vancouver this season, um, level bad then like there's no way that the flames would even entertain offering him a contract if he plays like he has then i think they might but they would do it at a significant discount yeah like i i would not expect like i, I don't even think it's uh, so much about the discount as just the length of the contract like i don't see a longer than two or three year deal for any amount. No, I don't either. And, and if he's, you know, if he's playing like he did in Vancouver and he's making five and a half or somewhere near there, most contenders aren't going to have that much budget to allocate to him. So while he, I mean, I think everybody wants to go to a contender. Show me a player that doesn't. Yeah. He might not have that option. True. And that, that's where, like, I think that he might just play his options during the season. And if he's playing to an elite level, then he might not want to sign here. And if he... Um, does then you know that's fine too. Like it, it's one of those where, uh, you know, just like uh, with all the guys that were traded this year, it's kind of just sitting there waiting and seeing, and uh, it's hard to tell until you get there. And you know, any of the permutations make sense based on his play over the last two years. So you kind of just have to wait and see what. He is and respond accordingly. For sure. Um, and then I guess the other player here that I wanted to chat about was Connor Zari. And we talked about him, you know, as a center and what we thought of him as a center previously. He's been centering for the week a line with Jonathan Huberto. And they've tried a couple other guys on there right now. They've got Dryden Hunt there. Um, but I thought he had a really strong game in the Battle of Alberta game. Um, they looked like they connected Huberto and Zari quite well. Dominated possession in the first. Solid outing in San Jose, I would say. I mean, we saw Huberto on the board there. Um, it was the Anaheim game where Zari and Huberto really were rewarded for that play. And Zari um, scored again today. Exactly. And, so, yeah, And he is fit like a glove. And, you know, he was a center throughout his junior career and as a AHL player. Uh, so it made sense to start him on the wing at the NHL to ease him in. But, you know, now that you're in... Uh, but that that makes it sound like he's jumping right from junior to the NHL, though. This guy's played a couple of years in American League, and he was still a winger there. Yeah, and it, it's one of those where... It's not like he's going from junior to the NHL. Well, it, he did play some center in the A, too. So it's one of those where... I think the only time from what I've been able to see that he played center is when he, someone got kicked out of the dot or something like that. But he was he went into every game, it looks like, starting the game. At uh, um, I haven't watched a ton of the Wranglers or the Stockton Heat. Because he played for so. the Wranglers, what? He played one 2020-2021, I think, was when he got hurt. So he only played like nine games there and then... Uh, 53 the next season, 72 for the Wranglers. So, yeah, I mean, he's been primarily a winger as a as a professional. Well, and the thing is, is that it's hard to get players that are centers at, at the NHL level, period. And, like, we saw, like, how many draft picks did we throw at centers trying to get guys to replace the Lankos, etc., uh, from the the previous iteration and like it took Monaghan and Bennett and a handful of other draft picks just to get enough serviceable NHL centers out of it. You know, like if you can turn Zari into one and he plays well enough as a center, 
then it's kind of found money, frankly, for the rebuild. And, you know, you, you can then allocate resources in other directions, whether it's drafting a different player or, you know, like a different position for, like, a defenseman or a winger if need be, um, if you have a guy like Zari as a center. Do you think Zari slots higher in the depth chart as a winger or a center? Probably higher as a winger than the center, but I think that next year, if you keep him at center, uh, what I would kind of expect would be Kadri's the line one center, Zari would be the line two center, with Backlund being the line three center, uh, with like the second and third line basically getting equivalent minutes, and you know, then f- and if he stays at center, do you keep him with Huberto? Possibly. Uh, I think that largely depends on uh, who the wingers are and how they're doing uh, chemistry-wise because like, there's a lot of things that will happen between now and the draft and free agency and all that. Uh, so it's a little hard to pencil in all of the wingers, but yeah, it, we'll see. I, I think that you know he will probably... like The way I would utilize him would to be uh, with Huberto and uh, Kuzmenko, frankly, um, and let that line rip for a while and see how... Because uh, Zari's always been an excellent defensive player uh, in juniors. Like That was one of the things he was renowned for was his two-way play. Uh, so if he can be the stabilizing force defensively on that line and allow the other guys to do their thing, like, that could be a really successful line. Right now, the Flames have Marty Postel playing on line one with Kadri and Kuzmenko. They've moved Sharon Govich back to wing, playing with Backlund and Mangiapane. Then we have Huberto, Zari, and Hunt playing on the third line. Like, when I look at that, and I have a strong feeling the Flames are going to go out and get a centerman, whether it's through trade or free agent acquisition, I think that Z- Zari becomes your 3-4 center. You can't do four because you got Rooney there. I think they'll probably end up moving him back to the wing next year is my guess. And he'll probably be a, a top four winger. So he'll be on your top two lines as a winger. I think that that's, you always want a guy you can slide over there or who can, yeah. um, you know, you can move over if you need to and injury or whatever. But I think you'll see him play more games next year as a winger than a center for the Calgary flames. Yeah, I can definitely see that too. Like, um, that's one of the benefits of having guys that are versatile, like, uh, Sharon Govich, like Zari, like Elias Lindholm previously, where they can play all three forward positions at a relatively equal level. So, you know, and necessity becomes the mother of, <laughs> you know, uh, line deployment at that point. And, you know, you kind of just play things by ear depending on what exactly your team is. Yeah, I mean, you know, they, I think the Flames will give him options of both. I think they'll try him, especially in the preseason at both, but I think he ends up going back to being a left winger. The next story here is uh, the end of the year is just about upon us and the internal team awards starting to be awarded. The first one got awarded today, actually, and it was the Peter Marr Good Guy Award. This is voted on every year by the local media that um, the Peter Marr Good Guy Award will go to the Calgary Flames player who best exemplifies Marr's values in their dealings with others, sincerity, integrity, dedication, and respect. This year's winner was announced after the morning skate today, and it's Blake Coleman. During the presentation of the award, um, Coleman appeared with his two daughters. And uh, Wes Gilbertson of Post Media said this is the first time that one player has appeared on every ballot, which is very impressive. So congratulations to Blake Coleman for winning that one. I hope this isn't like the Lady Bing where a lot of guys actually don't want to win it. Um, We all know Peter Marr, and I guess maybe it's just the name of it that, you know, makes it seem a little... I don't know, maybe a little soft, but Peter Marr is a great guy, still around, still there, with, did the presentation today, and uh, good for Blake Coleman. Yep, uh, definitely deserves it. I think from the media side, too, Coleman's been the guy that even after a loss has been able to come out, speak clearly, you know, give the sound bites the media needs. Like, you know, I, I think he's had a heck of a season on the ice. Off the ice, I think he's grown more as a leader. I think this has been a really strong season for Coleman all the way around. I agree. 
And Matt, let's end off here. We don't have a ton of time. We're nearing our uh, our time here, so we won't spend a ton of time talking about this. But Al, our listener who writes in very often, wrote us a question. He says, hard to believe it's nearing the end of the season already. I've always really enjoyed your podcast and certainly adds the overall Flames experience, even though they didn't make it, though. I guess it's been a realization of an issue brewing for a while. Actually, that could be another topic. Why do we get to this point in retrospective? The non-signings, the Sutter experience, the lack of depth, the Goudreau or Chuck phase, etc. So Al kind of asking us about how did the Flames get here? And I'll give my thoughts first. Um, then you can chime in. When I look back at things now, I think that ever since Brad Treliving came to town, there has been a push on an immediate playoff push. Brad's been building year by year to have a playoff team. I mean, we see him trading around, trading away first and second round picks. And we see him, you know, making big free agent signings like Troy Brower, like James Neal, things that if the Flames would have gone deep that year, even one wouldn't have become an issue. And it felt like, you know, looking back, the Daryl Sutter signing, I think was a signing designed for immediate success. I think every year Brad's been mortgaging the future to bring in players that can help that year, maybe the next year. And the flames I think are in this position because they did mortgage some of those pieces. They got rid of some of those pieces. They brought in older players. They spent more money on guys like Kadri, things like that, but they were really pushing year by year for the playoffs. And I mean, they're not the only team that did that. Don't get me wrong. I still think Troy a great GM. I still think he did great things for the Calgary flames, but I think the flames are where they are because they were looking year by year to be a contender. Well, and this has been my criticism of every single Canadian team since 93. Uh, like none of the teams actually like there's a reason that no team in Canada has won in 31 years. And it's not because of Gary Bettman. Like they, n nobody is willing to actually follow through with doing the right things when it comes to building your team and being patient and, you know, letting the team grow organically. There's always that rush. Um, like, uh, you know, the flames, I think, frankly, had that season in 2014-15 that screwed up the organization. Uh, and when they, uh, you know, made the playoffs and, you know, unexpectedly made it to the second round that year. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, rebuild's done. Let's, you know, go into contender mode. And, like, the Flames didn't have any depth in their organization. Like, they only just had a few guys, frankly. Like, it was just Monaghan, Bennett, Gaudreau, and a few other small pieces. And, you know, like, in my mind, like, rebuilding teams need to have, uh, at a minimum, at least 20 top-tier prospects, like uh, Hanzik-level like where it's like your foundational guys in your uh prospect pool like Poirier, like Moran. Players that you're Wolf. expecting to be to be, you know, possible yeah, guys any, who are gonna be starters at you know on your yeah, you top need, line, top level, yeah, that sort of and thing. And you look at teams that have been successful, like I'm gonna use the Chicago Blackhawks as a blueprint. Like when they were in their terrible phase, like they had about twenty five guys that were top tier prospects and you know a bunch of them didn't turn out like guys like cam barker who was a third overall pick he was a lousy player in the nhl but they had so much depth of high quality prospects that enough of them turned out that they ended up being a cup team and like the flames when they went through their rebuild they only had like six or seven guys that were of a uh, upper tier caliber and then turned it on into contender mode. And, you know, then like they just didn't have anybody else coming up through the system because they mortgaged all their draft picks and they didn't have enough beyond Goudreau, Kachuk, Monaghan uh, to do anything. And, you know, like that's you look at every Canadian team that they all do the exact same thing. And like the, that's why like they're good on paper, but when it gets time for the playoffs, the teams with the actual depth kick the ever loving crap out of any of them. Um, like how Colorado just manhandled Edmonton a couple of years ago on route to the cup. 
you know, and you you have to build your team sort of like Colorado or Chicago or Boston, where you have just a dearth of high quality guys coming up continually in order to, you know, maintain your team. And like right now, the Flames have maybe five or six guys that are in that group, if that, and... You know, like, it's going to take a while to build up those assets. And, you know, like, frankly, uh, like, the death knell for the team as it was was the entire organization was built around Kachuk and Gaudreau, and then you delete those two guys, and it doesn't matter who you put in, like, the team's going to fall apart. And, you know, to be fair, like, they did nearly make the playoffs last year, which I think is an achievement in and of itself. And, you know, it, it's just one of those things that they just have to build from here and get as many top-end guys as they can and hope... If we, if we look at each season as a vacuum, it wasn't terrible, right? I no. mean, if we look at each season as building for that season, and at the time, I mean, I've criticized the Cali Yarn Croak deal a few mm. times and how much the Flames gave away for that, but on a year that it looked like they could go deep, that's the kind of deal yeah. you make. Right. You, you make those deals to bring in, you know, veteran guys. But now looking back at it, I mean, now looking back at the Hamilton deal and a lot of these deals, maybe they weren't the best deal to make in hindsight. But hindsight's always twenty twenty. I think Tree was building what he he was doing, what he had to do. And yeah, I mean, we can look back at the Huberto deal and say it's not a good deal at this point, maybe. But at the time with, you know, Kachuk asking to leave and wanting that to be the destination, that was probably the right piece to acquire from Florida. Well, and frankly, uh, you know, what gets lost in that, it, you know, in my mind, it's uh, the Huberto uh, or the Uyghur trade with Kachuk. Exactly. Like, he has really cemented himself as a top tier, like top 10 defenseman in the NHL. Uh, over the last couple seasons and he's under contract for a long time and you know in a lot of ways like how he is as a player and a person like he reminds me a lot of Mark Giordano and so you know in my mind like he kind of has replaced that role for this team for the you know foreseeable future and you know as much as Huberto's you know up and down like if he can find a way to recapture more of what he's been since the new year, uh, heading into next year, uh, the the trade will look a lot more balanced. But uh, I think that uh, you know the Flames didn't get fleeced entirely in that trade. No, and even with Huberto's deal, I mean, yes, the Flames re-signed him, but again, at the time with the information we oh, had, yeah. it didn't seem like a bad no, deal. No, right now maybe realistically, it does. Um, the Huberto that's playing now is probably a six and a half to seven million dollar player, and that's with mm -hmm. how badly he's struggling. You know, he's still a you know high quality player. So, like, yes, he's overpaid. You just hope that he turns more into the eight nine million dollar kind of player next year, and you know, go from there. Yeah, I, so, you know, I mean, Al, hopefully that answers everything. Sure, there's non-signings. I mean, there's been talk in non-trades. There's been talk about, you know, the Flames had the chance to bring in Eichel. The Flames had the chance to bring in Stone. I don't know that those things would have changed the fortunes no. of the team all that much. And we never know. I mean, they may have, they may not have. We have no way to know. I don't want to sit here and say that if the Flames brought in Eichel, things would be different. Or if the Flames brought in Stone, things would be different. We don't fully know what the return on either package was. And again, you know, you can have one great player, doesn't mean you have a great team. Yeah. So, and frankly, like, changed. as much as, you know, like uh, getting Stone would have been awesome for that season, like the reason that trade didn't go through was that he refused to sign here. And he mm -hmm. would only sign with Vegas. So that's why that trade happened that way. So, you know, I mean, yeah, could, you know, could things Ottawa have happened for one season? Sure. He actually preferred our deal from what I've heard. But, uh, you know, uh, the Flames needed the guarantee of the, the pen to paper on a contract, and it, that was only going one way. So, you mm. know, they had to get Brandstrom yeah. in the first instead of uh, Valimaki in the first. And, you know, I mean, we've heard about the Eichel deal where, you know, the Calgary was rumored to be sending Peltier and Wolf back. Uh, you know, and, and again, I mean, who knows what the future would have held, but right now those are two valuable pieces for the Flames. 
So, you know, yes, some of these things could have changed the way things happen. I mean, you know, the Flames took a couple of cracks at Kadri as well. And if they got him earlier, could they have changed things? Maybe. I don't want to sit here and say that they would have or wouldn't have because we don't know. The Daryl Sutter experience he mentions, again, if you're trying to sort of squeak out everything your team had for playoffs, I think Daryl Sutter was the well, right coach at that even time. Even as I said when we were in the lead up to possibly hiring him, either way, Daryl was going to sort that team out. Either they would find that level of success or it would be that this team doesn't have it in them and you rebuild. Well, that happened. And, you know, like uh, the team didn't have that gear with the group that was and so now we're going into this retool rebuild situation where yeah daryl proved what the team was yeah and that was a necessary thing and you know like i know some people don't like daryl or you know hated that how it turned out but you know to me it was a pitcher perfect uh situation like the flames were really awesome the one year and before Gaudreau and Kachuk left, gave themselves as much of a chance to be a cup caliber team that year. It didn't pan out, and now you see what the team, you know, that there wasn't that next level to that iteration of the team, and you move forward. And, you know, we're in that phase, and Conroy's done an excellent job thus far. Yeah, I mean Conroy Huska, I think needs credit as well. Neither of those, oh, yeah. neither of those Huska's guys would a, be in their role if not for the Daryl Sutter experiment. Yeah, and I do have to say that Huska has done an absolutely picture perfect job, in my opinion, uh, for a first year coach in a situation like this. It was not an enviable situation for him to start his NHL career as a coach, and in my mind, he passed with flying colors and. You know, I'm perfectly content with him being the coach for the foreseeable future. Huska's like he, a development coach, and that's what the Flames need right now. You yeah. don't need a Tortorella. You don't need, you know, a Sutter. You need a, a development guy, and that's what they've got. And honestly, with how well he teaches defense, I would not be surprised if he doesn't eventually turn into a John Cooper level guy. Yeah, and that's high likely. praise for me. And for, um, for listeners that don't know what you mean by that, explain a little bit. Uh, John Cooper, he came up with uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning in their organization, and um, he was very much a d defense-minded coach when he got hired, and he helped to uh, build the Lightning into uh, the cup team that they became and uh, the perennial elite team that they've been ever since so he's the longest tenured coach in the nhl and won several stanley cups and all that and i could see huska being that caliber of coach uh, if uh you know especially with his ability to teach defense yeah i mean we'll see again i don't want to predict too much out but hopefully i'll we've i'm not necessarily saying with us i'm just saying for sure like of uh young coaches like he seems to be of that group that like will be the guys that get hired again and again and again, um, more so than uh, some of the guys like the Oilers have hired, where it's like, oh, he got hired, and then you never hear from him again. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of been the curse of Oilers coaches, though, right? True. Well, Al, hopefully that answers your question. I mean, you know, we'd be happy if there's anything specific you want us to expand on. Let us know. We have one more show next week before we wrap up the season so get a hold of us through our social media channels firesidechat.ca you can email us from there however you find us online let us uh let us know if you want us to chat about anything else or break that down any further matt we saw a six five win tonight for the flames that game's over that leaves us with two games left on the season yep and thankfully it's just two more games to go until this year is done and um, you know, it, it's been a disappointing season, but a, not an unexpected season. Then you and I can uh, go visit our friends at Bow River Brewing and uh, try to forget this one happened. Yeah, basically. Um, at least, like, heading into the season, you know, as far as I was concerned, like, either signing the soon-to-be UFAs to long-term extensions, if it made sense, or getting maximum return for them, if the Flames weren't in a playoff position was basically goal and priority number one. And 
to my mind, the Flames had a very successful season organizationally because of that. Um, they got excellent returns for everybody that they moved. And, you know, it's just a matter of rolling with the punches to next year. And Let's have some of this discussion next yeah. year. You're starting to ra- wrap on up the season and we still got two games Oh, to I know. Go. I know. I just wanted to throw that in. We have a home game and a road game. The road game is in Vancouver on Wednesday or sorry, Tuesday. Um, so not that far for the team to go. It's an 8 p.m. start in Vancouver. And then the final game of the season, Fan Appreciation Day, back home at the Dome on Thursday, a 7 p.m. start. Matt, neither of us did very well last week with our predictions. What are you predicting for the final two? Well, I'm going to go with win-win uh, just because that's the way the Flames usually do when the points don't matter. So, I was trying to look up today and see how often they win on Fan Appreciation Day. Um, couldn't figure out exactly what day Fan Appreciation Day has been every season, but I'm going to be a little less optimistic. I think that they're going to lose to Winnipeg. And they're going to win Vancouver or sorry, uh, Vancouver. I knew it was one of the Canadian teams I'm talking and I think they're going to lose or sorry, they're going to win to San Jose. I think that there's going to be a big push to end off in the dome on a high, on a high note with a win for the fans. I think the coaching staff is going to do everything they can to make darn sure that's a win. I think the players are going to make darn sure that's a win if they can. And I just I think there's going to be different energy about that one than there was tonight against Arizona. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that one in person and having a proper send off for the season, and you know, look forward to the draft and all that fun stuff to come. So two more games uh, next week. Matt and I will recap the rest of the season. We'll do we will go back through our our season predictions that we made at the beginning of the year, talking about how we did on those. Some of them are good, some of them not so good. We'll look at them all next week and give ourselves a final score. We should have final comments from Garbage Bag Day, which will be interesting. That's the day when uh, the Calgary Flames players always go and do their end-of-season recaps as they uh, clean out their lockers. So we should have a lot of interesting information there. And we will uh, cover everything else to do with the season next week um, as we wrap things up. So, Matt, we've got two more games. This one's almost done, for better or for worse, and we'll see how they play out. Yep, and as always, go Flames go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.